Amen. What a day that will be, church. It's good to see all of you here. It really is. I've missed you so much. It's been too long. Honestly, I kind of feel like I need to reintroduce myself, right? It's been, it's been that long. My name is Jordan, right? No, no. but it, man, it's, it's good to have you guys in here. And those, us, those of us online, thank you for being here. Looking forward to seeing you guys very soon as well. Today, church, we are starting our, our Easter series that's going to take us all the way through the month of March, all the way to Resurrection Sunday, and we're going to be talking about Jesus. In this, in this series, we're just going to be looking, it's a Christological survey, so that basically means we're just going to be talking about who Jesus is, which I'm, I'll be honest, I'm super excited about this, about this series because it's kind of stemming, it's kind of overflowing from my studies at Southwestern, and, and, and I've been looking at extensively kind of just the way that this question has been answered throughout history, who is Jesus? And the truth is, church, we need to define this question even today. Because the truth is, church, we live in a world where we use the same vocabulary, the same words, but we have different dictionaries. We're, we're using different definitions of the word Jesus. I'll give you an example. So, so I'm a few years removed from youth ministry. I used to work extensively with students, with youth, with teenagers. It kept me on my toes, right? But when I was working with youth, I was, it was like, almost like I was like a missionary in a different country because I'm like listening to the language that they use, the words that they use. And, and those of you who are around teenagers, you know, they use a word that you may use, but they mean completely, something completely different than you mean, right? Than what you mean. And it's just like you're speaking a different language. And so when I was with them, I would, I would learn, I would understand what they were saying. Oh, when they, they, they use this word, they meant, they meant this. We use, it, we use it in this way. But now that I'm a few years removed from that, and I still get to work with teenagers from time to time, with, especially with coaching, some of the things they say, I'm just like, what are you even talking about? Because we use the same vocabulary, but we're using a different dictionary. Church, we need to do the same when it comes to the language of our faith. Here, like so we, many in this room, hopefully many in this room, and then many around the nation, around the globe, will say, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I'm a follower of Jesus. But here's the thing. They'll, they'll, many people will say that exact same phrase, and I will say that exact same phrase, and yet we will mean something completely different. Why? Because what does it mean to be a Christian? Does it mean you have, uh, you have been saved by the blood of Jesus? Or does it mean that you go to church every now and then for, on Christmas and Easter? Because some will define Christian in that way. When you say you believe in God, which God are you referring to, right? The God, Yahweh, the God of the Scriptures, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or some other God. And when you say you are a follower of Jesus, what do you mean by Jesus? Because that is the question we're going to be answering throughout this survey, church. Who is Jesus? We're going to be, we're just going to getting, we're going to get down to the basics today. Who was Jesus? Who is Jesus? And who will Jesus be? Those are the questions we're going to be answering today. So if you have your Bibles... I want to encourage you to open them up to Matthew 16 today. We're going to be jumping into right in the middle of Jesus' earthly ministry. He has, been, he has been teaching, performing miracles, walking throughout with his disciples, with this caravan of people around uh, the, the region of Israel. And people are starting to take notice of this, this, this man from Nazareth, this carpenter. And Jesus takes his disciples to a place to help them understand who he really is. Because people are beginning to ask, who is that guy? Who is that, that carpenter? Who is that guy from Nazareth? Who is this Jesus that I've heard so much about? And Jesus defines himself for us. 
Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, it says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say or who do the people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for the for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Amen. So, so Jesus takes his disciples, the 12, and he takes them to this, this, this little city, this town on the northeast side of Israel called Caesarea Philippi. This is a Gentile city. This is a lost city. The city sits at the foot of Mount Hermon and these, this mountainous regions, which Mount Hermon is actually one of the highest points in Israel in the region. It's actually, throughout the year, it's covered in snow. It's snow-capped. And during the warm season of the month, it, when the ice melts and the snow melts, it's actually what is the source of the Jordan River. And so it's this high, huge mountain, very important to the survival of the people in the region. Because without the snow that will eventually melt, they will not have water. But at the foot of this mountain, Mount Hermon, in Caesarea Philippi, which is built around the foot of this mountain, there's this cave. And interestingly enough, there's this ancient, in, D, in Jesus' time, there was, this, there was this river. It's not there anymore, but there's this river that, that kind of flowed f- through the mountain from the top where the, where, the, where the snow melted, and it kind of flowed out the cave. And in Jesus' time, there was this temple built around this cave, this temple dedicated to the pagan god Pan. Now, the Gentiles, the people of the city, they believed that this cave was the gate to Hades, was the gate to hell, because they believed that water flowed from the underworld. And so they built this temple to try to appease this god, Pan, to help uh, make sure that that river never stopped flowing out of that cave because it was their survival depended on it. And it became this place where sexual immorality thrived. Because they would perform these sexual and moral deeds to appease this God named Pan. And it essentially became this red light, religious red light district, all right? And, and you can imagine Jesus taking his disciples to this city, to this temple at the foot of Mount Hermon. And I, I can only imagine they were probably, what is going on here? Like taking a bunch of Baptists to a bar, right? This is awkward. This is confusing. What is, Jesus, why did you bring us here? And he asked them this question, looking around at the crowd, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say that the Son of Man is? And now, when he says Son of Man, he's referring to himself because earlier in chapter 12 uh, of Matthew, Jesus revealed himself to be the Son of Man. That is uh, God in the flesh, the Messiah that they have been waiting for for so long. And Jesus asked them, In the middle of this pagan city, who do they say that I am? And some say, they replied, they answered, they're not falling asleep in class. Some say John the Baptist. At this point, John has been beheaded, he's dead. And so some some are saying, well, John came back. You know, he's such a holy man, he came back and, and, and you're him reincarnated or something. Others say Elijah. You may recall in the Old Testament, Elijah ascended into heaven. He was taken up into heaven. Some others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Notice the diversity of definitions of who the people say that Jesus is. Some say this, some say that, others say that. Plurality. 
different definitions. Same vocabulary, multiple dictionaries. Think about today. What does the world say about Jesus? Who do they, how do they define our Jesus? A man? A really good teacher? A, revol- a guy with revolutionary ideas? A guy that was a hippie that was all about peace and love? Now, there are aspects of those definitions that are true, but Jesus is not only those things. He is so much more. And so Jesus is asking his disciples, who do they say that I am? And then he turns to them and he asks them the most important question that they could ever be asked in their lives. But who do you say that I am? Okay, you've given me the definition of what they say. What about you? How do you define me? Who am I to you? And Simon Peter replied, he's always the first one. I appreciate Peter. He's that kid in class that's always the one that's willing to to take that leave of faith and answer the teacher's question, even though if he gets it wrong or not half the time, right? Simon says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And what he's doing here in this profession, this proclamation of who Jesus is, he's acknowledging who Jesus is. You are the Christ. That is, you are the Messiah. Christ is the Greek form of of the Hebrew word Messiah. The one that they've been waiting for, the, the world has been waiting for, the people of Israel that have been waiting for, for centuries. You are the Messiah. And you are the Son of the living God. He is acknowledging Christ or Jesus' humanity and Jesus' divinity through these two statements. You are the Messiah because generally uh, it was assumed that that the Messiah would be a man, that he would be a messenger from the Lord. He would be a man that would save his people. But he's also the son of the living God. That is, he is divine. He is both man and divine. And he's acknowledging that Jesus is all these things into one, one, one man, one God. And yeah, it may be a little confusing how he can be two and yet one. But Peter says, I don't need to know the the details. All I know is that you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are the one we've been waiting for for all this time. You are God in the flesh. And Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now, Bar-Jonah means, Bar means son in Aramaic. And Jonah or John, which is... Peter's dad, he basically saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. In other words, blessed are you, Simon, because you did not take the definition of what the world gives you of who I am. You did not take that definition from the world, from the flesh and the blood. You took it from the spirit. You took it from God himself. You allowed myself, you allowed me to define who I am. Because that is the only correct definition. And he said, because of this, in verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter. He uses his name. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, there's some wordplay here, because Peter and the word for rock or stone in the Greek sound very similar. Uh, Cephas. You are, and and so he's he's doing a little bit of wordplay. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church my church now are there there are different interpretations of of what jesus is doing here on building this on building on this rock his church there are some uh who i would consider brothers and sisters for the most part uh especially in the catholic faith who 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 believe that this is all about uh the pope jesus is uh, proclaiming apostolic secession to the pope in rome and, and, and in that seat, whoever's in that seat uh, of, of being the Pope, it, that, that line can be traced back all the way to Peter. I'm not so sure that they got that right. Because, because what, he, what Jesus is building the rock on is that confession of faith. On the confession of faith of who Jesus is, that is where the church will be. And he says, and on that confession, 
in that decision to acknowledge who Jesus really is, both God and man in one who came to die, to live the perfect life, to die uh, the, the death that we all deserve, to, to be raised from the dead on the third day. That proclamation, that confession, there the church will be built. And, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Again, think about the context. They're sitting at the foot of a cave where many around them believe leads to Hades. And, he says, and Jesus says, whatever's in that cave ain't coming. Ain't going to do nothing to you if you just believe in who I am. And whatever you bind, or I'll, and I, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the keys to heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, whatever you loose on earth, those, it will happen in heaven. In other words, I'm going to give you uh, the authority. I'm going to bestow upon you my authority. And then he says, interestingly enough, in verse 20, he's, he, the, the light bulb is finally starting to go off in their head a little bit, the disciples. And then Jesus says, okay, 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 I just enlightened you a little bit. But don't tell anybody. Now, I'll be honest, I, some of us today, we may use what Jesus says here at the very end of this section of Jesus telling his disciples not to tell anybody. We say, well, that's why I don't share my faith very much, Jordan. Jesus says, don't, don't tell anybody about who he is. We can't do that, guys. Come on. Because later on in Matthew 28, this is just a temporary instruction because Jesus has a mission. He's trying to get to the cross. And, and if everybody understands who he really is, they will not crucify him. Because later in Matthew 28, Jesus says, he turns them loose, right? Matthew 28, go and tell. Not just the people around you, the nations about me. And that's what we're called to do, church. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting to think that even in Jesus' time, when he was here, when he was present on earth, he had to define who he is. Now you add 2,000 years to that to, to get to us today and this defining of terms is still taking place we still have to define who jesus is you've, you've heard that phrase uh, lost in translation the definition of who jesus is has been lost in translation but here's the thing there's nothing new under the sun church nothing new this conversation has been taking place since jesus ascended into heaven you think about the, the writings, the scriptures, the apostles, they're having to write down and explain who Jesus said he was. Because he had, they had to define the terms because there, there were rumors, there were stories, there were other definitions that were going around the church saying, well, Jesus was actually this or that. He actually wasn't who you think he is. And they had to define the terms. And then the, the, the apostles, they passed away, John being the last. And then uh, these individuals who are known as the early church fathers, these individuals, these uh, leaders of the church who kind of took the mantle from the disciples, from the apostles, and kind of uh, brought the church into uh, what we find today, had to define the terms to the point that there were these theories, these ideas of who Jesus was that began to arise that were just completely false. The, the biggest, uh, most well-known individual was this guy named Arius. Um, he is probably one of the first and probably most prominent heretic. That is somebody who, who teaches a false doctrine that we know as a church. And he, believe, he taught this idea that, that Jesus wasn't really God, God. He was like a, he was like a semi-God. And, but he, they related him to a creature, like, he was just like us. He was created. And so if, if, if Jesus was created, there was a time when Jesus was not. And, and uh, many of the early church fathers, they, they, they were trying to wrestle with, with this type of heresy and others because there's this paradigm. There's all these definitions, plurality, all right, of definitions just like we see today. And they, they held this council called the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Just, you know, 300 years after Jesus is gone, they're still having this conversation And they kind of come to an agreement. And they basically say Jesus is like God in nature and in substance. That's the language that they use. And they break. They, they, they end the meeting. People aren't happy with that definition, with that language. And so they, they'll use that language 
some of these Arians, these people who follow Arius and other false teachers, they begin to use the same language, but they twist it. They're using, yeah, yeah, Jesus is like God in nature and in substance. But what they mean isn't the same by what those who, who truly believe that Jesus was the Son of God, God in the flesh. They, they were using the same vocabulary, church, but yet they were using different dictionaries. And so they had another council. A little over 50 years later, 381, the Council of Constantinople. Now, just so we're all aware, a, count, a, a church council, these, these are basically like church business meetings like we have today, right? Like, except they're not talking about what color the carpet's going to be, you know? So, but, but so they are trying to define the term of who Jesus is because they bring it together and they say, all right, all right, we got to get this right. Who is Jesus? What does the word say about Jesus? What did Jesus say about himself, about Jesus? And they eventually said, you know what? There's going to be people who are going to use a different dictionary than we are. We can't, we can't control that. All we can do is make sure we understand and define Jesus according to what the word says and what he said about himself. And so they have this, uh, this creed it, that they took from Nicaea and they kind of made it their own. And for, like they reaffirmed basically. It's like it's a mesh of, of the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. And it says this. I'm just going to read you a portion of it. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our, for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was man, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Church, even though they came to an agreement somewhat of who Jesus was based on the scriptures and what he said about himself, this defining of terms still takes place today. We still have to uh, make sure we are on the same page of what we mean by who Jesus is. Because the truth is, church, the world uses different definitions. When I say I'm a follower of Jesus, I mean that I'm a follower of the Messiah, of God who took on flesh, who humbled himself before creation by entering into creation, by living the most perfect life, the life that we could never live, by dying the death that we all deserve, by being buried in the grave, and on the third day being risen from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven. And in this moment in time, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his return to usher us into his presence. Church, that is what I mean by Jesus. But the world will say something different. The world will say he, is just a, a, he was just a good teacher. He was just a man. Uh, he, he, he's a creature just like us. He, 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 was, a, he was just a, you know, a revolutionary. Uh, you know, they, there's all these definitions. But church, here's the thing. That's not what scripture says about him. And so I'm asking you the question that, that Jesus asked his disciples. And the question that I believe Jesus is asking every single one of us today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? Because here's the thing, church. This is the most important question that you could ever answer in your life. Because the way you answer this question, I will argue, I will be able to determine what type of faith you have. And in turn, what type of life you live. And that's all based on how you answer this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because here's the thing. 
If you believe in a Jesus that is other than the God in the flesh who took on flesh who, because, he, because he loved us so much and he wanted to bridge that gap between heaven and earth. If you answer uh, a Jesus other than the Jesus who, who died and rose from the grave on the third day. If you teach or believe or follow a Jesus that is other than the Jesus that is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting for his return. If you believe in an other type of Jesus, the truth is, church, I'm, I'm willing to bet you don't really follow that Jesus. Because that type of Jesus is not worth following. Because he's just a man. He's just a good teacher. You can find a good teacher anywhere. Maybe not here, but no, I'm just kidding. But hey, the gospel is at stake. You, some of you are maybe thinking, Jordan, why are you giving me a history lesson? Why are they arguing? Why are, they, why, why are we talking about this? Church, the gospel is at stake based on how you answer this question. Because the other type of Jesus, however you may define him, that's not biblical or not according to the way he defined himself, any other type of Jesus does not save church. Because that sacrifice for our sins that separate us from, 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 from God the Father can only be atoned for by a perfect sacrifice. And there's no one perfect besides God. So he has to be God. But he also has to be man. Because he has to be able to experience uh, the temptation of sin. And yet he has to overcome it. He has to live a perfect life. Church, who do you say that Jesus is? This is the most important question that you could ever answer in your life. Who do you say that he is today?